Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Modern Maker Workroom. I am going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to start involving a lot more of my process in what I say and how I teach, because I think that it can be really beneficial to people, and I, I really want to help people think more clearly about how they develop their historical clothing. Up till now, I have usually focused on just how to make it. This is how you create your pattern. This is how you put the garment together. These are the stitches that you might use. And what I have found is that I am not talking enough about the background thinking that goes into that. And I really would like to address some of that. Um, for example, one of the things I want to do for the next several videos is show you how I make my favorite 16th and 17th century jacket. It is a simple four panel jacket with sleeves and it buttons down the front. It is common in the 16th century. You can even see versions of it in the 15th century. And you can see people, particularly peasants, wearing them all the way through into the 18th century. So it is a garment that has a lot of time span. There are a lot of variations. It's incredibly comfortable. And when I put one of these on, I absolutely feel just like myself. Like I put them on and I just, I feel good. If you're gonna put trim on it and you wanna weave that trim yourself, it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be the worst, most time consuming process ever. And because a lot of these garments frequently have a lot of trim on it, I wanna make sure that I have given you the tools to be able to, to weave this trim really fast. From start to finish, it took me just over two hours to weave five yards of trim. Now, granted, I have been weaving with these particular tools since I was a teenager, so I've had a lot of experience with it, but that does not mean you can't spend the time to learn how to do it and to give yourself the training to move your body in the same motions and create the same very fast timeline for creating the trim. If you're creating 20 to 30 yards of it for a garment, you absolutely need to know how to do it really efficiently. You know, and I think you'll really enjoy the final product as well because you're like, well, I did everything. I made the trim, I applied the trim, I drafted the pattern, I made the garment, and there's something extra special about knowing that you made as many aspects of that as absolutely possible. Oh. I hope you'll enjoy um, this journey and come along with me. The things that you will need. I use this Inkle Loom. Inkle Looms come in all kinds of various shapes and sizes. This is just the one that I have. There are similar versions out there. There's smaller versions that give you two, maybe three yards. And there are larger versions, floor loom versions, in fact, that can warp up to 10 to 15 yards of trim at a time. My setup is very specific so that I can be as efficient as possible for my world your world is different. So make sure that as you're picking up your supplies and setting yourself up in your environment, that you're paying attention to leaving yourself the room to work. And then you'll need to have some thread. And I use 20 slash two silk that I get from webs. Now, if you are not familiar with webs, that website is called yarn.com and they carry all kinds of amazing fibers. Uh, the, these cones of silk are not cheap. Um, each one is about $70, so it's something to really consider, that especially if you're going to do miles and miles of trim, um, then it's worth the investment. I also use this for hand sewing. I use this for knitting. I have a wide variety of uses. This is their Valley Yarns 2 slash 20 silk, and I have it in black. And I bought two cones in black specifically because the way that I warp my weaving loom requires that I have two cones. Okay, so keep that in mind. Expensive, but worth it. I have this metallic thread. Now this I get at one of the Sewing Notion stores that is in my area, but um, other cones like it and spools of thread like it are available in most embroidery stores. Another thing that you're going to need is a set of weaving tablets. Now these I purchased from uh, lacis.com in, in Berkeley, California. And they are just small little square cards with 
four holes in the corners and one in the center. Now, the one in the center is used for a thread that adds um, some structure. I don't ever use that for making trim. In fact, I don't even use all four holes for weaving this particular trim. I only use two holes on opposite corners. So keep that in mind. I have eight of these for this project and eight of these with the threads that I just showed you, eight of these creates a trim that is about one eighth of an inch wide. Something else that I find invaluable is a clamp so that I can clamp my weaving loom to my table while I'm working. You'll see that in the video as well. And then probably the most important tool in the arsenal is a really good properly shaped weaving shuttle. Now this one is about 10 years old. I have used it a lot as you can tell by this deep divot that is in the sharp edge. A good shuttle for tablet weaving actually has a beveled edge. Like this is very thin, it's been sanded down so that it's almost like a little part of a blade. And then the other side is left quite rounded. And then you have these notches that enable you to wrap your thread around and uh, load up your shuttle to do your weaving. Now this um, shuttle is very basic. It just has a triangular notch and a triangular notch. I used a double strand of the silk to load up this shuttle. And that would be very, very helpful when it comes time to actually weave the trim. I want to have that double strand because I need it to be a little bit thicker to create the slightly ridged texture of the trim that I want to have. A pair of scissors, a little bit of time, and some elbow grease as well. And with that list of supplies and tools, we can go ahead and get started.
The secret is in finding the relaxed, sustainable rhythm that you can just keep doing indefinitely. It becomes a meditation where you are just moving in synchronicity. And that is the goal. It's just keeping the smooth movement. Once your warp gets to a shortness that you can't maintain that anymore, then it's time to shift the warp and move on to the next length of it. So I have to loosen down here, put some slack into it, and then grab the warp and just shift it. And that gives me another eight to 10 inches of warp that I need to weave. And now I'm back to a place where I can have a nice, smooth, even rocking rhythm. And that's really what it is. It's just this rhythm of rocking. And I'm, my body is moving a little bit side to side. It's just very comfortable. Part of the efficiency is that you should never be doing anything that feels too tense. My hands are in very relaxed positions as I work. My motions are smooth and even. When I pull the weft through, I grab onto the trim that's already woven and I pinch it slightly. And then I can feel the strength of the thump that happens when the thread is pulled tight against the selvage. And it's the intensity of that thump that I'm paying attention to to make sure that my weaving stays the same width. I'm not actually looking at how wide the trim is. I'm feeling the tension with which I'm pulling against it. And that's what's helped keeping it regular. It's a very different way of thinking about the process is that I'm feeling my way through it instead of seeing my way through it. One of the reasons why it's so important to get comfortable with this and why I prefer this method is because I've practiced it over the years and I've gotten very fast at it. And when I'm considering making something that is 17th century, I know that I have miles and miles of trim that I have to use. You know, sometimes 20 to 30 yards is what is necessary to create even the most basic well-trimmed garment. And so when you consider the labor that goes into it, you begin to understand why fancy clothing was so expensive. Now for me, weaving like this is a means to an end, so I'm not spending a lot of energy being particularly fussy about it because I'm going to have so much of it on the garment. I really feel like if I have trim that deviates in and out by a sixteenth of an inch, it's not really gonna make or break the look of my garment. And even in surviving pieces, uh, particularly you can read about it in Patterns of Fashion, 1560 to 1620, Janet Arnold describes some of the trim on different garments as being different widths in different places, as well as the distances between those pieces of trim varying uh, in small amounts. So, you know, the inconsistency is definitely um, just a natural outcropping of doing something that's handmade. I am probably three quarters of the way done with this warp now, maybe two thirds. I'm going to have to load up my shuttle again because this shuttle is almost empty and I will show you how I do that. I'm gonna go ahead and just do it now. Even though I have a few more passes before I honestly need to, I'm just gonna go ahead and do it. So I have unthreaded my shuttle, and I'm gonna cut off, leaving a small tail. Now I have the thread hanging out of the warp in this direction, so I am going to begin my next pass from that direction. So I'll have two ends hanging out here, and then in order to lock that new weft in place, as I turn the shed, I'm going to pass one of those ends through, and then I'm going to beat the shed.
and pull it taut. And then I'm going to pass the other end through. And then I'm going to beat the shed. And finally, one last pass. And this brings me back into the alignment with which direction I'm naturally turning with each pass. So that gives me a nice, tidy join. And I'll weave a couple of passes after this, and then I'm just gonna, before I even uh, get too far, I'm just gonna cut off my tail ends. And that way it'll be done, it'll be out of the way, and it's not something that I will need to come back to later. So that one is gone. And this one is gone. I have just a few inches left to weave and then I can cut this off of the loom and that's super exciting. I think all told, this has taken me, since the moment I started warping the loom, this has taken me about two hours to weave five yards because I know this is a five yard warp. That's really not too bad. I think I could probably go faster, but Again, I don't want to cause too much stress for myself, so I'm uh, maintaining a leisurely pace. It doesn't matter how many times I weave a bunch of trim. The moment when I complete a warp and I'm able to cut the trim off of the loom and like just put it in a pile and look at it, and that moment is always so exciting to me and it feels just as exciting now as it did when I wove my very first piece of trim. Okay, that's as far as I can go. I'm just gonna cut this off. Now, I have two ways I like to do this. The appropriate way is to release the tension and then cut it off, but there is something extra special, I think, when everything kind of goes snap and comes right off. But for this purpose, I'm just gonna cut it here, and I'm gonna cut it here. I'm gonna throw away my excess thread. Here's my eight cards, all done, all ready to go for the next one. And then my completed trim comes right off the loom, ready to be measured, heat shrunk with the iron, and then used. Thanks so much for watching.